worship for Sunday, February the 28th, 2021, the second Sunday of Lent and Diaconal Sunday. The second covenant in this year's Lenten readings is the one made with Abraham and Sarah, God's promise to make them the ancestors of many, whom, with whom God will remain in everlasting covenant. Paul says this promise comes to all who share Abraham's faith in the God who brings life into being where there was no life. We receive this baptismal promise of resurrection life in faith. Sarah and Abraham receive new names as a sign of the covenant, and we too get new identities in baptism as we put on Christ. The Lord be with you. As we gather to worship in various places, may we be blessed by God, who forms us in word, sacrament, and community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Stephen Weber from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, and I'm glad to have you join us for worship today. In the season of Lent, we focus on spiritual disciplines, those things that nurture our faith relationship with God. On St. Paul's Facebook page are several suggestions about a spiritual discipline that you might like to adopt for Lent. An online daily Lent calendar, courtesy of Pastor Ann Anderson. A webinar series by the Jesuits called New Interpretations of the Holy Week Stories, which runs on Tuesday evenings. Or you might be more interested in our National Bishop's Daily Hymn and Prayer. These are just a sampling of the many opportunities for growing in faith, and I hope you'll seek out at least one spiritual discipline this Lent season. And another helpful spiritual discipline in Lent is to pause midweek for continuing education and reflection. This year, our Eastern Synod has arranged a series called You're Not Who You Think You Are, Lent and the New You. The astonishing surprise, often not realized until the end of life, is that you are far more than you could imagine, for you emanate from and are sustained by God. Each Wednesday in Lent, Pastor David McGinley will help us to explore this great surprise and ways we can integrate this truth into our lives. Several of us attended last week and we found it interesting and worthwhile. These Wednesday gatherings will be held by Zoom, so even if you don't use a computer, you can still hear his presentations by telephone. Details are in the bulletin. Please pass the word along to those who might not be watching this video. Our Sunday School's collection of donations for sleeping children around the world ends today. Donations can be mailed in, left in the church mailbox, or sent via email to treasurer at stpaulscambridge.org. In our prayers today, we pray for Mayor Catherine McGarry, on the unexpected death of her 36-year-old son, Jordy, this past Monday. May God comfort with the sure and certain hope of resurrection, all who mourn. Thank you to our Minister of Music, Katrina Lowe, for playing a prelude and postlude for us today. And thank you to her mother, Karen Peters, for recording Katrina's music. Thank you also to our reader for this day, Josh Hyde. In these challenging and unforeseeable times, if you find that you need someone to talk to, or if you need any assistance, please email me or phone me at the church office and I will help you. At whatever time and location you are accessing this, thank you for doing so. It is good to be together in whatever way possible in this time of physical distancing. We continue now with worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, ever creating, ever transforming, ever enlivening, source of love and liberation, our heart and our home. Amen. We are unfinished. Our universe is unfinished. We confess the ways in which we attempt to limit God's creative power working in and through us. creating God. Shape us into fruitful co-creators and faithful stewards of your design, liberated by your covenant to bless and to be a blessing. In Jesus, we have met the one who with his very life 
showed us the power of love to transform the lives of all who are vulnerable. We confess the ways in which we steadfastly cling to our rights and entitlements, refusing to be changed or even touched by the world's pain. Transforming Christ. Move us from comfort to courage, from empathy to engagement, from prayer to policy change. All things belong together. We are many, we are one. We confess the ways in which we have allowed separation from God within me, from God within you, from God within creation to define us. Enlivening spirit, breathe into us the breath of your grace that we may release our hold on the fear and arrogance that keep us from knowing wholeness. Beloved, God's forgiveness is fulfilled in Christ. Because we are unfinished, we are ever being recreated. Because we have met Jesus, we are ever being transformed. Because we are both many and one, we are ever being enlivened with the Spirit's power, the power of grace, in whom we live and move and have our being. Forgiveness, grace, and love are yours to have and yours to share, now and always. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Children's time. Diakonos, servant. I am so very glad that you're here today, and I know that you're bringing sunshine and joy wherever you are. Today I want to teach you a word in another language. How many of you are taking French in school? Well, the word I want to teach you isn't in French, it's in Greek. That's the language that the New Testament was originally written in. When the early Christians first wrote down the stories of Jesus, they wrote them in Greek because it was a widely understood language of the time, much like English is today. So here's the word I want you to learn today, diakonos. Can you say it with me? Diakonos. It means servant or helper. Your waiter or waitress when you go out for supper is a diakonos. Now I imagine that you'd rather probably be a superhero rather than a diakonos or servant, huh? But one of our strategic directions these are some words that tell us what we're all about at St. Paul's. One of our strategic directions is that St. Paul's seeks to excel at serving the community, both globally and locally. Being one of Jesus' followers is all about being a servant, a diakonos, and serving others. In Lutheran churches across Canada, today is Diakonal Sunday. Sounds a bit like that Greek word diakonos, doesn't it? Lutheran churches across Canada will be talking about servanthood. And in the sermon today, we're going to hear more about what it is to be a deacon, a servant of God. Now I invite you to move into your favorite prayer posture. It may be hands open facing up to receive the gift of God's presence in prayer. It may be hands folded and eyes closed to help you concentrate. Or it may be crossing your arms across your chest to form an X the first letter of Christ in Greek, and it feels like a hug from God. Now let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for being our diakonos, our servant. 
May your loving servanthood to us move us to joyfully serve others so that we can be diaconoi, servants, just like you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Your parents have children's bulletins for you that you're welcome to work on at any time, even while you're listening to the sermon. God blesses Abraham and Sarah. As with Noah in last Sunday's reading, today God makes an everlasting covenant with Abraham and Sarah. God promises this old couple that they will be the ancestors of nations, though they have no child together. God will miraculously bring forth new life from Sarah's womb. Their name changes emphasize the firmness of God's promise. A reading from Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. The promise to those who share Abraham's faith. Paul presents Abraham as the example for how a person comes into a right relationship with God, not through works of the law, but through faith. Though Abraham and Sarah were far too old for bearing children, Abraham trusted that God would accomplish what God had promised to accomplish. A reading from Romans. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written. I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. 
Today is Diaconal Sunday, the day the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada celebrates the ministry of service. Through our baptism, all Christians are called to loving service in Christ's name. The Greek word for service is diakonia, and from that we get the terms deacon and diaconate. So Diaconal Sunday is also a day to recognize and give thanks to God for the men and women who serve in official calls as ordained deacons in our church. Here in the Grand River Ministry area, we are blessed to have Scott Kanar, who serves as Diaconal Minister of Music at St. Matthew's in Kitchener. He will be preaching in many of our congregations across the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada today. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Word of the Lord. In 2017, I was privileged to represent the ELCIC at World Diaconia, the 22nd Assembly of the Diaconia World Federation, which gathered in Chicago. This event brought me face to face with deacons from every corner of the globe. I witnessed Lutherans, Anglicans, Presbyterians, United Methodists, Wesleyan Methodists, and others working together across denominational lines to live out our calling to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. I heard women from Fiji sing, and I listened to my sister from Jamaica preach. I learned that titles and dress for diagonal servants can be quite different from place to place, from street clothes to full traditional habits. The gathering opened up a community of deacons for me that was more colorful, more vibrant, and more connected to their diverse home communities than I could ever have possibly imagined. Today is Diaconal Sunday in the ELCIC, a day when we uphold the ministries of deacons in our church. While every baptized Christian carries out diaconal ministry in their daily life, sharing God's love where they live and work. Deacons have special responsibility for leading and equipping God's people in their service. The ELCIC roster of deacons is modest in size and spread out across the country. Each deacon's area of expertise is unique, and I would encourage you to search out a deacon in your synod and ask them about their role. Deacons are called to locate themselves at the edge places or margins of church and society. This means they may hang out with individuals or spend time networking in communities which are not usually at the center of church life. Deacons could find themselves in unconventional settings as they create opportunities to serve in new ways. 
They invite others into relationship, nurturing contexts for healing, as congregation members and community resource people accompany them to work alongside those whose voice is discounted or not able to be heard. One shining example of this action, going out to meet people where their need is greatest, is found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Gospel narratives are full of stories of Jesus crossing social boundaries and eating with people, healing people, and telling people things they don't want to hear. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus, the prophetic deacon, says very plainly that he will suffer, be rejected, killed, and then after three days rise again. But the disciples don't want to hear that news. It's not the kind of story they expect from the Son of God, and it's not too difficult to believe that the thought of Jesus rising from the dead might be beyond their understanding. Jesus doesn't wait for them to catch up. He takes things to the next level. He insists that we deny our lives take up the cross of Jesus as our own cross, so that in losing our life, we will save it. We should take a moment to remind ourselves that the cross is a horrific and dishonorable symbol in the Roman Empire. It is where criminals were hung to die in pain and agony along the roadway where all would see their plight. This is not a pretty accessory to wear around your neck. It isn't shiny, clean, and polished, but rather a gruesome image of the Roman Empire's power. To follow in the way of the cross is to follow Jesus the criminal who was convicted of attempting to overthrow the civic leadership of Jerusalem. The consequences of following Jesus are no less than giving up your very life. Sarah Henrich puts it this way, To lose one's life is to lose one's whole way of thinking about the world, to revalue the whole experience we know as life, trusting that our valuing of life may be the blindness from which we need to be healed, so that we can fully see and know the life that God gives us in God's realm. We have experienced a great deal of loss over the last year. We've lost our ability to grieve together in person, sharing stories and eating. We've lost opportunities to celebrate joyful occasions as well, no longer meeting in large gatherings with plentiful banquets. We have lost a sense of certainty and control as we strive to find safe ways to gather in community. We have needed to modify our patterns and rituals and to change our whole way of thinking about community life. This pandemic has pushed us to reevaluate how we do things. It's prompted us to reimagine what ministry means for today's context. Sacred moments, mediated through Zoom, live stream connections, and telephone calls, have brought the intimacy of spiritual conversation right into our living rooms. It has also renewed our awareness of disparities and privilege in our church, and in our society. This is a time to see differently. Since George Floyd's tragic death, we are further sensitized to how we value systems which have benefited certain peoples to the detriment of others. I own a house on the Haldeman Track, land which lies along the banks of the Grand River and promised to Joseph Brandt and the Haudenosaunee people who were loyal to the British crown during the American Revolution. My ancestors were among those loyalists who arrived to farm the land, and I have inherited the resulting benefits 
such as having a good education, living in a nice home with adequate heating, clean running water, and a stable internet connection. I want Jesus to walk with me, and I will take up the cross of racial justice, educating myself about how my assumptions are contributing to discrimination and privileged thinking. I want Jesus to walk with me, and I will hear the cry of broken hearts, broken lives, and broken communities, and I will not look away. I want Jesus to walk with me, and I call on our church to decolonize policies and systems which harm relationships with marginalized communities. Abraham and Sarah were faithful to God, trusting that God will accomplish what God promises. In Romans, Paul writes that God's gift of grace to Abraham is offered to all people, and fulfilled in Christ's death and resurrection. Through faith in Christ, all may be made righteous. Douglas Hall describes the righteous one as being for real or genuine, being right for the vocation to which one is called. This action of God making us right is what enables each of us to become our authentic selves. When I began visiting Six Nations, it was my musical training and expertise that was seen as a valuable asset. But as I helped to facilitate the Music for the Spirit program, I quickly realized that the skills I have and the style of music I'm most comfortable with are really not what was needed. The youth of the community needed support to discover their voice, to make their own music, and to create a sense of belonging and identity for themselves. As an outsider to the community, my best contribution is to help achieve those dreams by making available resources and a safe space. When I die to my own ego, as well as dying to my fear of making mistakes, then I can truly live into God's grace and love my neighbor. Clifton Black writes, In the economy governed by the gospel, the only way to be made whole is to let go of everything society reckons most valuable. There is no benefit in gaining the entire world, values and aspirations as people define them, if in so doing, one forfeits one's deepest soul. Letting go of the benchmarks of success, like program finances, numbers of participants and profile within the community, is not easy. To be made whole, my soul needs God's grace to be open to the other, open to doing things in ways that may rub up against empire, open to being transformed by the resilience of my Indigenous neighbours, and open to the inexhaustible promise of the gospel.
relying on the promises of God. We pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need, saying, Hear us, O God, and responding, Your love is great. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to deacons and all the baptized, that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God, your love is great. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you tending to creation's well-being. Move us to lower our carbon footprint and come to the aid of those hurt by global climate change, especially the poor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and social justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. In Jesus, you join humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving, especially Mayor McGarry and all who mourn the death of Jordy. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression, and help all in need, including those whom we name before you. Hear us, O God, your love is great. We pray for all those who are working to keep us safe and to heal us during this pandemic. Be with all frontline workers as they approach exhaustion. Bless the work of those planning the distribution of vaccines. Help us all to do our part by keeping to our household bubbles and grant resilience. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. As we come to the end of Black History Month, open our eyes to systemic racism and help us to celebrate diversity. Bring an end to the lies of white supremacy. Grant that we might see one another with the same loving eyes that you do and remind us that Jesus was a person of color. Hear us, O God, your love is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip us to minister to families. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. We await the day of Christ's coming. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace. Receive the blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen.
Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thank you.